This content is brought to you by Uphold, which makes crypto investing easy. I've been a user of Uphold since 2017. They're one of my go-to exchanges. You can buy, sell, and trade cryptocurrencies on Uphold. You can also trade precious metals and equities. They have 10 plus million users, 250 plus cryptocurrencies, and they're available in 150 countries. As with all exchanges, you can buy and sell on them, but I highly recommend you custody your own crypto, not your keys, not your coins. If you'd like to learn more about Uphold, please visit the link in the description. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Congressman Darren Soto, who represents Florida's 9th District. Congressman Soto, it's an honor to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, Congressman, I followed you for years and uh, you know, you've know you done a lot of work with crypto regulations and different bills, and I'm excited to speak with you and go through all of that and, and some of the recent bills as well. Uh, but I would love to start with your background. You know, Where are you from and where'd you grow up? Well, I'm originally from New Jersey. My whole family moved up uh, from Puerto Rico, including my dad, um, back before I was born. My parents, uh, my mom's from of Italian descent, grew up in a uh, Puerto Rican Italian household in North Jersey, which is very common, um, yeah. by the way, in that area. But like many North Jerseyans, I found my way to Florida early on in life uh, as I was going to law school at George Washington University. And uh, my whole family ended up moving down around 2000 and up from Puerto Rico in 96. And the Central Florida area is uh, known not only for our theme parks and for uh, our space flights and uh, and NASA, but also for a huge uh, combination of folks from the tri-state area, the Caribbean, and and folks uh, who traditionally Southern folks. So it's a real uh, diverse community, and it's uh, one where we have great weather and a, a great environment, and it's a beautiful place to live. Oh, that's awesome. And what made you decide to launch a political career career and get into politics? Well, really, it was to meet folks from my law practice. Uh, I was in a small firm with a distant relative and a few other partners, and uh, they said, you got to get out there, got to meet people. And uh, I've always been a, a Democrat ever since I was 18 years of age. And uh, so I thought the Young Democrats would be a great way to, to network. Uh, what I found, though, is that it was a pretty uh, small organization, the Young Democrats. Uh, but I always look for opportunity and for potential in life. And so within two meetings, I got on the executive board and uh, we quadrupled, quintupled the the membership through social events and and uh, doing some cool interactions with elected officials and the like we'd call speakeasies. And uh, from there, we uh, had a bunch of us who decided to run for office over the next couple of years and and just crushed it. And uh, from there, it's, you know, I always was a lawyer who wanted to write laws, right? And uh, and help out uh, our community and improve people's lives. And so was in the state house and then in the Florida Senate. And now I'm in my fourth term in the Congress and have been working on issues related to fintech, cryptocurrency and blockchain uh, for most of that time. Mm. And on a note, you know, you've worked with um, other folks from across the aisle, such as Congressman Warren Davidson and Tom Emmer, uh, tell us a bit about, you know, when you first started working on crypto legislation, um, was it like the Token Taxonomy Act with Warren Davidson and, and you know, where are you at today? Well, I got to say, it really started with a conversation with my wife after I got home from seeing the Senate do their first Facebook hearing and uh, realizing I, my wife was saying, man, <laughs> Congress really doesn't know anything about technology. They called it the Facebook. They read their interns' cue cards and asked basic questions. You know, we at least use technology. You should be more involved in those things. And so I've got involved in a lot of areas of technology, from fintech to space flight and uh, to uh, helping out in uh, AI and, uh, and in telecom. So I've worked on... Uh, a lot of areas of, of technology. We're working on privacy legislation and uh, seeing this rise of cryptocurrency 2017, 2018, and being from a very international area, right, where we do a lot of business across borders. We have tourists come in from across the world. We're constantly uh, doing business for tourism and for agriculture from our area. 
So I thought, okay, this would be, this is going to be one of the ways to do business of both the present, but also the future. Uh, think about like a travel agent from Orlando booking a, uh, a, an experience for folks from Brazil or Australia or East Asia or in Africa. And, and so I, I viewed this as a really great uh, area to help our region in the long term and for remittances, which uh, very important for a lot of first generation Americans in our area. So this, along with those areas like space and AI, I've been pretty involved in and, and seeing that uh, Warren Davidson had his, uh, his, uh, token taxonomy act uh and we uh we put together the digital taxonomy act where we really tried to get these jurisdictions set right because cryptocurrency can be a, a currency it could be a commodity it could be uh in some instances a security although i know we want to um make sure that that jurisdiction is airtight and uh and and so we we know there's CFTC, there's the FTC, there's the SEC. Uh, so the the bill for the two bills together have been combined to try to create a jurisdiction continuum of of when each of these agencies should um, should govern. And uh, not lead, needless to say, it's been a challenge. We've gotten parts of of the bill into law. And then we've seen um, the Biden administration put forward uh, their proposals, but bills like this, it takes a while to get everybody to have their opinions uh, and, uh, and get them across the finish line. But look, I'm in it for the long haul and uh, we know uh, we'll work on smaller bills since then. We've had some success though, with cryptocurrency, with the budget. Every year we get all these amendments into the budget to help out uh, whether it is getting the IRS to give uh, uh, tax advisory opinions on on what people owe uh, in revenue and uh, whether it is the broader blockchain area that we're trying to utilize to do food tracing to keep track of uh, veterans records, uh, working with that in conjunction with AI to solve some of the major problems because blockchain is trustworthy, right? It's a, a fixed medium, a fixed ledger. And uh, of course, uh, working on consumer protection, along with uh, promoting America's excellence in in the uh, in the blockchain space. So we uh, we're going to continue to utilize the budget until we can get some of these more substantive bills passed. Mm. And then there was a recent one that was introduced last week with Congressman Tom Emmer. Uh, you and Congressman Tom Emmer reintroduced the Securities Clarity Act. Um, along the lines of what you were talking about, what's a security, what's a commodity, and trying to figure all of that out, right? Absolutely. We we distinguish between the seed money that comes in to help establish uh, an exchange uh, versus the actual uh, exchange once it's up and running. So uh, we define the investment contract asset as, you know, what people know of as cryptocurrency once the exchange is up and running as different and separate from that seed money that comes in that's necessarily capital to help um, get these up and running. And uh, and that makes sure that we have technology neutral uh, legislation that, that doesn't bias against uh, a, a cryptocurrency, which as you know, and we've been discussing in this interview already, can evolve depending on its uses and, and the law needs to reflect that. Absolutely. Um- However, we find ourselves uh, in a very tough situation. There seems to be a lot of enforcement actions against the industry. Many entrepreneurs and innovators are frustrated. Many are looking to leave the United States, and some who wanted to come to the United States are pumping the brakes. Um, and it's a lot of companies now are, you know, crying out for help. Uh, you know, trying to talk to different folks in DC. Uh, because it seems the SEC is not providing clear guidelines. They're doing a lot of enforcement actions. There's what some we call Operation Choke Point, the potential debanking of crypto companies. Um, you know, how can the United States get this right? Because we got it right with the internet, and there were many economic benefits. Uh, huge companies that were birthed out of the dot com boom with uh, Googles and uh, Amazons and so on and so forth. How can the United States get it right with crypto and blockchain? Well, it takes oversight from Congress. Uh, a lot of my colleagues who work on this are on the Financial Services Committee, like Ward Davidson and others that that work on these issues from the SEC side. 
I work in it primarily from the FTC and CFTC side, being on the Energy and Commerce Committee and having jurisdiction over FTC, and then now being on the Ag Committee again, having jurisdiction over the CFTC for the commodity aspects of it. Uh, so we we need the Financial Service Committee to continue to push back when uh, some of these actions are unwarranted. Look, we're in a, a nation sort of starting time period over these last five years of, uh, of cryptocurrency. There have been some great exchanges and then there have been some issues, right? And some others. And uh, and so that always draws uh, the agencies to, to put more scrutiny under some of these exchanges. And I think that's where Congress has to step up to make sure we have that balance. Uh, when you look at some of the other superpowers of the world, like China, who've banned it altogether, uh, relative to them, we're a relatively friendly space. Uh, but we know there are some smaller countries out there that that have um, really freed up their, their laws quite a bit. We've seen some states do that as well. And and states are, during this nation period, the, the workshops of some of these laws. So I don't think that the history is fully written yet, um, but there was a lot of pressure with one or two high profile cases um, for some scrutiny. And I think we need to push back when it comes to um, on a case by case cases where that scrutiny may not be warranted. Uh, but look, this is a sign of arriving. As you get to be a more mature industry, you, you're going to have uh, a lot more interaction with with the government because we're talking about exchanges with billions uh, uh, of dollars on there in value, and 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 obviously we want to both keep our competitiveness and protect consumers. Make sure that when people invest or utilize cryptocurrency for their transactions, that that they can trust that, and that's going to be good for the industry long term because without integrity, you'll have people questioning why we need these systems, and and so having that integrity makes sure. Uh, that for the long term, there, there's confidence in using this, and especially in my region, uh, for international transactions, this is going to be a really important uh, manner of doing business going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And and well put, you know, we need the guardrails to protect consumers, but also the balance to not stifle innovation and to allow these companies to build and create jobs and, uh, you know, put out useful technology and, and that can be applied in the real world. Um, and... I know it it seems like you know you hinted that states are kind of taking the lead here ahead of the federal government. Um, do you think you know that would be the catalyst as more states become more friendly to crypto where they're accepting Bitcoin miners and they're letting companies uh, build out their blockchains and do their things uh, that that will eventually sway the federal government and members of different members of Congress? Definitely. and that's the natural progress. For instance, for internet privacy laws, um, it's a few states that have put them together, and now we're finally coming around to getting a federal standard. <clears throat> it's states like Wyoming, who I know have been on the avant-garde on this, uh, along with even states like Florida that are starting to develop certain rules behind it, my, my own home state, um, that come first because they're much smaller groups of people, right? 22 million in the state of Wisconsin, <clears throat> Wyoming, they have 600,000 people as right? the least populated state in the union. So these are places where they start working as these state workshops. And then as so many states start having rules and some of them differing, we need a, a solution for 340 million people in the most powerful nation in the history of the world. So when we arrive at a solution on the federal level, it's got to be right because it's going to set the trends for uh, a lot of the, a lot of the world. Although I will say there is a timing to it. Uh, Europe got their internet privacy standards out more quickly uh, than the United States, and so they are driving it more. Um, larger states like a Florida, Texas, or California can also, by the sheer size, and New York by the sheer size of those four states, uh, can also move the needle. So uh, we can't wait too long, uh, but it's okay to see the states. Be these di these workshops in democracy and figure out what's um, what's the best for um, the nation. Yeah, absolutely. Hard question for you, Congressman. Um, you know, with the different bills and these different things that you've been working on with with your colleagues. You know, when do you think? What what does your gut say that uh, Congress will act to pass comprehensive regulations? Once again, that's balance, protects consumers, 
but doesn't stifle innovation? Well, my hope is that we can at least get some regulatory clarity in some of these um, sort of singles and doubles type bills passed into law, like the Securities Clarity Act over the next two to four years. Mm. Getting the whole regime, gosh, th this is one of, would be one of the first amendments to securities on um, in many, many years, particularly defining new assets is not something that happens. Most of the securities and, and financial laws date back to like the 20s and 30s and 40s. Things like the the uh, the Great Depression and the stock market crash. So uh, I always knew it was going to be a challenge to define some new assets for the 21st century. And, and I think the more important thing is we're going to be ready to keep fighting for as long as it takes. Uh, a lot of us are who work in this space are younger members of Congress. I'm the policy chair for the Future Forum, which is the youngest Democrats in the Congress. And I work very closely. I'm also the vice chair of policy for the Hispanic Caucus. So um, we are in this for the long haul to get it done. But it could take a few more years at the very least. Um, but I, I wouldn't speculate it. If I had that, I would be uh, playing the lottery tomorrow too. Uh, so we <laughs> But right now, just know we're going to do everything we can, and we have to get some of these clarification bills through much more immediately as we work on, on defining the entire uh, jurisdiction uh, and rules of the road. Now, there seems to be, and I, I, I could be wrong here, but more Republicans who are in, in support of this technology and the benefits um, than there are Democrats. And there are obviously Democrats. You're one of them. I know Richie Torres and a few others as well. But folks seem to think that maybe it's, I don't know what it is, uh, if it's like the Elizabeth Warrens, the Brad Shermans and so forth, who are very anti-crypto, seem to be swaying the, the, the folks that believe that Democrats are not so much in support of this technology. So this is a two-part question. Is is that true, uh, you know, that perception? And second, are, you know, what are you doing as far as helping to bring some of your Democratic colleagues on board to understand the benefits of this technology? Well, first, uh, I've passed more amendments into law related to cryptocurrency than just about anybody on the Hill, and I'm a Democrat. So uh, there's a lot of people who filed bills, but I've actually, through the budget, passed each year a half a dozen or more amendments to help out both cryptocurrency and blockchain. Uh, and I'm the co-chair of the Blockchain Caucus, which is equal parts Democrats and Republicans. Uh, certainly you have some fellow champions like Ro Khanna, Josh Gottheimer, <clears throat> Richie Torres, uh, uh, Jake Auchincloss, to name a few who are very active in the space. Before I even got here, Jared Polis, who is now the governor of Colorado, but was uh, in the House at the time, uh, led a lot of these charges. Uh, so we've had Democrats work on these issues for a long time. Look, we we Democrats care about consumers, so we're always going to make sure the little guy and girl doesn't get screwed in some financial scheme. That is uh, part of our morals as a party, um, mm -hmm. but it's not limited to cryptocurrency. It's stocks, sure. bonds, it's banks, it's it's across the financial industry. So welcome to Washington. If, if Democrats are going to be fighting for consumers, but consumers are your investors, they're your customers, right? So so we all should care about consumers. So there's certainly some with more zeal than than others. Um, but, um, you know, when the Republicans were fully in church, we didn't see a comprehensive cryptocurrency True. regime. And, and we're closely working with the White House to try to get the right balance. Um, I know the SEC chair has frustrated both Democrats and Republicans. So yeah. we all kind of in a in a concerning position about some of some of the overreach but in other places you know they needed to act right so i think the key is that for the future of cryptocurrency it does need to continue to be bipartisan and i'm not here to disparage my republican colleagues in any way i i, I work with them on these issues even right. as we vehemently disagree on a lot of social issues that you know happen to be more progressive on on and a lot of the democrats are so uh, I think at the end of the day, we're we're going to do as much as possible to keep together as many Democrats and Republicans as possible uh, on these things and, and get the right balance. And this is this is hard, right? We're we're, we're developing a, a new set of financial assets 
uh, when that hasn't happened in decades. Uh, and so I go through it with clear eyes that it's going to take a lot of work and, and I'm in it for the long haul to help us get there. For sure. And certainly appreciate all the great work you've been doing. Um, what are your thoughts on these presidential candidates and, and kind of new blood coming into the fray who are becoming pro crypto, pro brick Bitcoin, you know, RFK Jr., uh, even your governor Ron DeSantis, who seems he will be running for president. Um, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, is it a bit of the generational shift. Maybe they're a bit younger like yourself and they understand the technology because you mentioned before, you know, when the Facebook hearing and I watched, I was laughing when you said that because I was literally talking to my wife about it and even my parents, they, they didn't understand just certain principles of the platform. Um, is it a generational thing, but also, you know, more advocacy and education that's needed and, and, and as well as, you know, the new candidates who are supporting crypto? Look, as we know, President Biden is the president of the United States. I'm a big supporter of his. We've worked on um, a blockchain center of excellence, and uh, he rolled out the executive order. We didn't agree with everything the agencies came back with, but he's at least tried to move the ball forward where the Congress has not. Um, just because an agency may say something that we like or don't like doesn't mean that that is the president of the United States' opinion. He's trying to be a fair arbitrator. And when you have competition, folks running against them, they're going to look for ways to to come up with new ideas or contrasting ideas. I think that's part of a democracy. Uh, but we didn't see any movement under the first Obama administration or under the Trump administration. We heard a lot of platitudes, and now we're seeing in the midst of Congress's inaction at least the president trying to move the ball forward with executive branch decisions that that are really the first of their kind. So uh, it's it's always tough to be the king, right? And it's yeah. and and it's harder to make decisions than to be able to 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 lob bombs and say that uh, it should be this way or that way. But at least he's in good faith moving the ball forward, and and we uh, I'll be continuing to uh, talk to him and his administration about uh, about what we need to do going forward. But I I, I view the the dialogue of the executive order and the responses from agencies is important because we are not going to get this comprehensive reform done without, frankly, hearing from everybody and their mother uh, in Washington, from the agencies, from the administration generally, from the um, from the Congress. And then, of course, the courts will get their say after all that's done. So. Um, the dialogues are happening now, at the very least, and uh, having a blockchain center of excellence um, is important for the White House. And and so they're working l not just on the financial stuff, but on the underlying technology, which I know we're focused on cryptocurrency here, but we know blockchain is really important for aggregating data mm -hmm. on climate change, on healthcare. Uh, we even see dissidents in China put messages on the blockchain that then the Chinese Communist Party can't take off. So there are many ways to use the blockchain even beyond finances that are also things I'm thinking about daily. Imagine taking all this information aggregated from decentralized from many different areas about climate and using AI to help us parse through all of this to come up with some uh, improved solutions to help save the planet. So there's there's a lot to be done in the financial space of this and also in the scientific space of it with with blockchain generally. And we'll we'll continue to work with the president. And we'll be um, hearing from lots of candidates with lots of ideas. Uh, actions, though, uh, I think speak the loudest and uh, and we'll we'll continue to work on those things together. For sure. And on that note, you know, uh, every central bank around the world, including the United States federal government or Fed. Federal Reserve, uh, is working on a CBDC, a central bank digital currency, tokenization of the fiat currency on the blockchain. Um, here in the United States, at least, uh, you know, the digital dollar, uh, we've heard a lot of talks about it. Um, you know, there's going to be certainly a lot of economic benefits, a lot of, you know, benefits in, in how the money can move and uh, making the economy faster and more liquidity and all that. But folks are concerned about the right to privacy and the alignment of the digital dollar to the constitution. That's something I'm concerned about. And, you know, we see China's model in the digital yuan and uh, it's programmable money. So maybe years from now, some draconian regime comes in and they do something with it. Right. And, and that's the fear people have. What are your thoughts on that? And, 
you know, how can we make sure the Fed gets this right? First, if we do have a fiat cryptocurrency, it shouldn't be there to supplant these private sector exchanges, right? Mm -hmm. It should be there more as a reserve, just like we hold bonds and stocks and gold and other uh, assets, right? So I could see uh, it also will help further legitimize, I think, cryptocurrency by knowing that Treasury has a form of it, but shouldn't be there to supplant it. As far as uh, privacy, you know, we already ha have had uh, bank accounts with electronic money for many years, right? You don't have like a stack of dollar bills in, in your bank account. It's, it's, it's a number in your account based upon assets that are there. So for many years, for better, for worse, if there is a subpoena that's approved by a court, People can go into our bank accounts, our stock uh, accounts and, and money market accounts and track things, right? And so it usually, but it has to be done by a court of law. We, we shouldn't be getting beyond that where the government can just track for no reason. We have laws, but we also have terrorists and other folks who use all sorts of types of things from stocks and bonds to gold to even crypto to try to to get paid to do nefarious things. And, and we need to track all those. I don't view this as a cryptocurrency direct problem. This is something that across the financial market, you're always going to need an ability with a court of law approving it for people to be able to track money if someone has has uh, is alleged of a wrongdoing and there's probable cause to, to do that. So I, I think the key is we need to make sure it's the same rules for cryptocurrency as it would be for stocks, for your electronic bank account, for um, gold or any other asset that you hold. There shouldn't be a an, an advantage in one over another. It should be accessible only it, upon a court order. Mm. Yeah, it, totally in agreement. And I, I think, do you think it's legislation that has to put those guardrails in? Because once again, it's programmable money where it's centralized. So at some point you can update the algorithm, so to speak, to do certain things, to restrict certain things, um, whether, you know, based on your political stances, I don't like you're a Democrat, I don't like you're a Republican and, you know, you could do these things. The, the potential is there. I'm not saying it's going to happen. And I think that's what people are concerned about. Is it just having the proper legislation in place and the guardrails? So we're not even at like, getting regular cryptocurrency <laughs> regulated <laughs> yet. We're way off from a hypothetical situation that'll probably eventually happen. But what I could tell you is that we, assuming you still have private exchanges, which the, that would be my main concern. This shouldn't be there to, to crowd out the private sector uh, exchanges that are out there. Those exchanges would be subject to the same laws in the future that they are now. You'd have to get a subpoena, you'd have to get a warrant to be able to get this information off of a private exchange. And that should change, not now or, or in the future. It should be the same requirements that, that are required. It, it, the only way the government would have access to all this information if that the only thing left was a fiat currency. And I I, I simply don't think that that's gonna happen, right? Because there's, there's gonna be benefits to one or the other and people will be able to choose as as americans do they do they maybe they go for more stability but less privacy in the fiat or maybe they go for more privacy and and have the same fluctuation as stocks and bonds of other things and and, and mind you the u.s dollar does fluctuate as well um just less so but i think you know people will continue to have these choices and be able to make these choices and i certainly support um having those choices that exist uh well into the future Hmm. Um, final question here before we hit the wrap up questions. Uh, what do you think about blockchain and voting and, uh, you know, eventually where you don't necessarily need to go stand in line, but because of the blockchain, your data being on there verified by multiple agencies, it, you know, have you heard anything? Is that something in the works that where the U S is looking to do things like that? So West Virginia, I know, implemented that a few years ago, and I think other states are looking at it. It makes sense for overseas ballots, especially for our military, because right now they're actually voting via email, right? And and so the blockchain, we know it's a fixed ledger, right? Once you put it on there, 
it's impossible to take it off. And that's the brilliance of, of the technology. So uh, I could see it being a secure way to do it. Um, because of the 2020 election, a lot of people really want to see those paper ballots still around. So beyond the overseas folks, particularly our military, we're all sensitive to the fact that they are very busy. They may be in remote locations uh, helping defend the nation, keep our national security interests. So we want to make it as easy as possible for them to vote. So it's very hard to get a paper ballot all the way over from overseas. Um, but for the stake of our elections, uh, I, I think Americans are going to want to see a paper ballot evidenced for them for the foreseeable future. So I could see it being in tandem with a paper ballot, like as a backup to help audit. Um, while right now it makes sense mostly that it that it's um, it's for overseas uh, soldiers and and, and Americans uh, in a limited use. Um, but but it's definitely already being utilized without any allegations of fraud or concern in a few states. And I think that'll expand. So what you're saying is in another 20 to 30 years, maybe. <laughs> I, I think we're going to want paper evidence of our elections for the foreseeable future, because with AI and other technologies out there, uh, it's it's easy to manipulate things, maybe not a vote on the blockchain, but maybe then people don't trust that fact, even though we know it to be a fact. It takes one person to be like, you know, I don't believe that. Sure in a position of power and suddenly people are questioning it and then they're questioning elections, even though they were secure. So I think uh, certain things are fundamental, but that doesn't mean we can't use both. I just perceive for the, for the future, at least for, for the foreseeable future that, that we'll have paper ballots too in, in every instance we can. Mm. All right. I got some wrap up questions here for you, Congressman. First is if you could create your own metaverse, where would you go? Where, where would Congressman Soto go to? Gosh, definitely create my own tropical island in the Caribbean uh, that I could easily, in a hop, skip, and a jump, get there from Florida. Uh, and uh, and there'd be a lot of music there because I'm an amateur musician. We'd we'd uh, we'd have a capitalist society, but with a strong social safety net. We would uh, we would live and let live, and and not uh, not pursue all these divisive social issues we see and we'd have great weather and lots of fun uh that would be that would be my my metaverse right there the the florida margaritaville uh type of dream that we, we all have in, in, in the southeast well funny enough you mentioned margaritaville i was down in florida <clears throat> uh in february for my birthday and, and me and the family we went down to margaritaville and hollywood beach it was pretty fun um, it's a lovely organization. We have those in Central Florida, which I hope those of you who are listening to this podcast uh, will will make one of your next vacations in the Orlando area. That along with Disney, Universal SeaWorld, we got it all. All right. Got some rapid fire questions here for you. Favorite food? Arroz con gondoles. Favorite musician or band? Pearl Jam. Favorite movie? Dune. Favorite book? Mm, Lord of the Rings. And uh, when you're not doing your congressional duties, what are you doing for fun as a hobby? Going to the beach, hanging on the lakes, playing music and spending time with Mrs. Soto. Awesome. Congressman Soto, pleasure chatting with you. Thank you for all the great work you've been doing on behalf of the crypto industry and the blockchain industry. I'd love to have you back on in the future, but thank you so much for joining me. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me.